I'm just going to go ahead and get started because um, I don't believe in waiting. I, I, really, I just want to hear from, from people in Georgia. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to dive right in. I'm, uh, I'm Billy Wimsatt. I'm the executive director, the proud executive director of Movement Voter Project. And, um, and I want to just get right into to hearing from uh, folks in Georgia. Mostly I have three words to say beforehand. Georgia, Georgia, Georgia. Like Georgia, you did it. Oh my God, Georgia, like you saved us. We're, we're so grateful to you all leaders in Georgia and everyone that, who you're connected to, who surprised, who shocked the world. You knew you, you knew you could do it, but we were all like, oh my God, you actually did it. And you're getting ready to do it again. So I just wanna welcome everyone. Welcome, yeah, you can say hi in the chat. You know, shout out um, where you're where you're calling from, and yeah, shout out the people in Georgia. I see all the love in the chat. So, um, if you're not on video, want to recommend you get on video so you can see and hear directly from um, all these incredible organizers we have on tonight. Um, it's actually my birthday tonight, so I'm celebrating. I just had a, a celebration, tucked my kids in, um, have a three year old and a seven year old. And um, just just thinking about their future and the world that we're leaving to them. And it turns out that what happens in the next seven weeks in Georgia will have a huge determining effect on my kids' future and on all of our futures. So we are just so grateful to be in support of the organizers in Georgia who hold all of our future in their hands, no pressure. Um, and just to talk numbers, you know, 40, 50 million is about the scale of what needs to be raised for all of the organizations in Georgia. Um, and looking at the numbers and, and talking to other people, we're about a third of the way there, um, not just MVP, but all of the funders put together, we're all coordinating with each other, are about a third of the way to that goal. Movement Voter Project donors have moved approximately two to three million so far, and we're have a stretch goal to try to move 10 uh, million to approximately you know, 30 to 40 groups um, collectively. So we have a lot of work to do. And the key is speed. You know, Your money is gonna be worth a lot more right now or tomorrow or this week than it will a month from now because the organizers need to know how much money is coming, how much can I staff up, how fast, right? This is a game of, of, of speed right now. So I want to encourage everyone to share this. Um, this is going to be an incredible presentation. And, uh, and you know, you're all organized in Georgia. Everyone on this phone is organizers. We got to organize our people to support our people in Georgia. Um, and I want to uh, uh, go to the next slide um, to just, if you haven't seen it already, uh, the Georgia Fund, um, the Movement Voter Project have set up. They're, a lot of good ways to give money to Georgia, to the groups on this call, to other groups, to other you know, partner groups who are moving money into Georgia. All of these ways are good. It's, they're all going to the right place. You don't have to wonder which one to give it to. You can just give it through any of them. It will get it to where it needs to go. Um, and a cool thing about this Georgia fund is that it's like a portfolio fund. So if one group meets its budget gap, you know, we'll make sure we're moving the money to where it's most needed. And, and Layla Ali, who you're gonna hear from later, uh, is our Movement Voter Project State Advisor, who's talking with the groups constantly about what they need and who needs the next 50,000 you know, fastest or whatever. So, um, so on this call, you're gonna hear from, and you can go to the next slide, NSA from uh, New Georgia Action Fund, uh, is their C4 name or New South Super PAC. Um, you're going to hear from Latasha Brown and Cliff Albright from Black Voters Matter Fund, and um, you're going to hear from Layla, and uh, and we're this is a a new format that we're we're doing. Uh, we're doing it at night. We've never done this before, and instead of me hosting it or a, an MVP team member hosting it, we have a special guest, W. Kamau Bell, who, if you're not familiar with him, uh, it's it's so great to have you with us, uh, Kamau. And I'm gonna pass it on to you and, and get right into hearing from our friends in Georgia. Thank you, Billy, I appreciate that. Uh, I don't know why Billy's bearing the lead. We went to high school together. <laughs> why, are you gonna, why are you gonna act like you don't know? Like, 
<laughs> Come on, Billy. We went to high school together. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I was like the most famous person in our class until you came along. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. I was. <laughs> I just I don't ever remember you sitting down. All I remember is Billy Wimsat going past like a blur. And uh, what's he up to? And so, yeah, so then I was like, one day I'll be famous enough to talk to him on a webinar. So I'm happy to be here. Well, uh, this is a webinar, but for those of you who know my work, I don't really do webinars. I do conversations with interesting, educated, motivated, fired up people who are trying to change the world. So that's what this is. This is a conversation. If you need to think of it as a webinar, that's on you. I appreciate you. But we are here to not only find out where we came from, but what we can do and how to extend us into that moment, like Billy is saying, where our kids can have a brighter day. I, I think about this moment a lot. My mom is 83 years old. And I feel like when she handed me the baton for the world, the world was better than when she showed up here. I feel like for the first time in history that we're in danger of handing the baton to our kids and going, sorry, we screwed that up. So I think this election, as Billy was just saying, is a time where we can maybe get a redo on that and not screw this up. So I'm really excited to be here. And of course, <laughs> as always, Black women are saving us. This time we're gonna give them the credit and the funds to do it in style. So that's what we're here to do, to talk to some of the people who are saving us, many of them black women, but here to raise the money so they can save us in style and not try to uh, make a quarter worth a dollar. So that's what we're here to do. Uh, I'm excited to be on this call. I'm excited to be with you all and excited to have these conversations. So first I'm gonna bring on Inse Ufot, who I just had the pleasure of meeting last week in Georgia. Uh, she is from, she's got a lot of slashes after her name. I feel like I, she's always repping, she's always repping Georgia, but there's always different organizations. So Inse, who are you repping tonight? Tonight I'm repping the New Georgia Project Action Fund. It's our C4 mobilization arm uh, where, you know, our C3 registers people and then the C4 takes them and we do dope, innovative voter education um, and voter mobilization tactics. How do we build super voters? Well, so my big question is, well, so I'll tell you a little about, we talked last week, but I had this moment the night of the election when it, before, even though I was told that like, don't freak out on the night of the election, there's going to be a lot of votes that come in later. And I had this moment where I was, where I, I forgot all that and thought, oh my God, did we just lose this election? And I suddenly had this thing of like, I didn't do enough. Like I didn't, I should have done more. And I feel like a problem, many people on this call had that feeling of like, let me make sure I do more. And we're focusing that right on, now in Georgia. Did do you have, you're a person who feels like you are doing enough. Do you feel that way? Um, I did, right? Like, you know, you say you plan your work and you work your plan. Um, and that's what we did uh, leading up to the general. Um, we also knew that we would be in this posture. So I have been working to sort of prepare our team and our volunteers and our voters for the idea. So one, we started, you know, in the summer normalizing uh, or we put out a lot of content saying basically normalize not having results on election night right so the idea was that it is election day it is not results day um, we're in the middle of pandemic and uh, there's quarantine we had a massive campaign uh, to encourage people to vote by mail and so we knew that uh, you know there would be that we would need time uh, in order to count the absentee ballots, the vote by mail ballots. And so even down to the playlist that we put out on Spotify for election night, I had Don't Panic, uh, two versions, one from Coldplay, if that's your jam, and the other one from French Montana. Uh, <laughs> the idea was Don't Panic, uh, that again, we had planned our work and like let the plan work. Um, so uh, I was not... Uh, I mean, you know, I was a little nervous. Let me not front for the people. <laughs> I was a little nervous, but I knew that um, at the end of the day, uh, election results in Georgia are determined by one, who shows up, and two, whose votes get counted. Um, and I think that the work that the New Georgia Project Action Fund, as well as BVM, um, had done up, leading up to this point, um, 
would 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 matter would count we had done our work to make sure that folks showed up and we have highlighted voter suppression educated the public about what that meant um and you know I, they say um, sunlight or sunshine is the best disinfectant, uh, but you know, based off of uh, you know my uh, experience growing up working class uh, in Georgia, they also say that you know roaches make the ro uh, light uh, turning on the lights make the roaches scatter, uh, and so when we think about uh, Georgia's 159 counties um, and 159 boards of election, uh, we you know with our partners have had a massive election protection apparatus that made sure that we had eyes on the people who were taking the votes and counting the votes. So. I mean, I was a little concerned, but I was really confident in the work that all of our uh, partners had put in leading up to November 3rd. Is it frustrating at all to see the work you're doing being questioned by now by certain people uh, in this country and being, or, and also just the, the results being questioned? I mean, yes, but we also anticipated that, right? Uh, there was a lot of hand wringing leading up to the election about, you know, what happens if he doesn't concede? What happens if, you know, there's white supremacist violence at the polls? What happens if, you know, they don't, they throw out, you know, legitimate ballots because of things like signature match, et cetera. Um, one, I think two, uh, I, I, I need people to know that in the deep South, that there are experienced organizers, sophisticated organizers who understand what it takes to have progressive wins and then defend those wins beyond one election cycle. And so we welcome all the support. We welcome all the help, all the love. Um, and we want people to know that uh, the, the South has something to say. Uh, and we have, again, organizers who have been building uh, uh, infrastructure uh, that has prepared us to meet this moment. Uh, as I was in, like I said, I was in Georgia last week in Atlanta. And one thing I noticed was that many of the activists and organizers I talked to are sort of bracing for impact for all the people around the country who want to help, but may not show up knowing how to help. Right. How, what would you say to people who, what are ways to not help? I think we're going to talk about ways to help. Right. Right. But what are ways in which people can like, don't, this is stuff you should avoid if you think you're helping? Well, I definitely have, uh, you know, dip my toe into the Twitter streets. Uh, and there are people who are, you know, tweeting about moving to Georgia to register to vote. And um, apparently that uh, made it onto uh, our Secretary of State's web, uh, onto, his, uh, onto his radar. And so he's put out a press release saying um, that if there are groups encouraging people to move to Georgia to register to vote, that they will be subject uh, to criminal prosecution um, that carries with it a penalty of up to five years in prison. So um, that's not helpful. Uh, but uh, I think that, again, knowing that there are groups that do this, um, that you can, you know, plug into, I think is really important for folks to know that we need to um, overcome voter fatigue. We need to overcome the noise that is associated with Thanksgiving and Christmas and Hanukkah and New Year's and Kwanzaa uh, and Festivus for the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, the phone calls, the text messages, the digital content, amplifying, uh, you know, the, the voter information, the voter education work that's going out is going to be super helpful. And then also your pennies and your dollars, uh, I think, uh, are going to be super critical in this moment um, as we prepare uh, to, again, um, do this again, do what we did on November 3rd. Know that there are groups in Georgia that, are, uh, that know how to win. Right, that know how to translate progressive policy uh, into Southern, <laughs> um, and that we welcome the support um, of organizations who are responsible for delivering this win uh, to America. So I'm gonna say just one name, you get asked about this person all the time. So I'm just gonna let you take the question any way you want to, Stacey Abrams. 
the queen. <laughs> yeah. What about her? What is, uh, how is, how are you, are you still working with her? I think people get confused sometimes about fair fight and what you're doing now. Um, yeah. How's she doing? <laughs> she's doing well. Uh, she's doing well. Uh, and is, uh, I think, getting her just desserts, um, right? The, the work that she has done, you know, as minority leader um, in the Georgia State Legislature, um, the work that she's done to found the New Georgia Project um, and Fair Fight uh, has helped us sort of create an infrastructure in Georgia that is designed, again, to make sure that people show up and two, to make sure that votes count. Um, I think, you know, she might even be, so tomorrow there's a versus uh, with uh, Young Jeezy and Gucci Mane, uh, you know, two popular Georgia rappers. And so she's out here, she's in these streets. Um, <laughs> I also think that, um, you know, a lot of because of the demographic shifts, right, that Georgia and the country is experiencing, um, there was a belief that we would be here, but in 2028, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are many of us who thought that we would be here in 2018. And so, uh, you know, the entire country saw a governor's election uh, be stolen, a governor's seat be stolen. Um, and instead of uh, retreating and hopping in her feelings, um, you know, she got to work. Uh, and so I think that that energy um, has spread amongst the organizers and folks who do this work. Um, and yeah, uh, Stacy's out here, uh, I, I, she's super visible, helping us raise money um, and helping us, again, make sure that we have the infrastructure to meet the energy and the excitement of this moment. Uh, we have like 10,000 people from across the country who have said, I want to volunteer. I want to show up. I want to make sure that these Senate races um, that Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff um, go to DC to do the people's work. Thank you, Inse. Uh, I'm going to bring you back later when we have a whole group discussion. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, uh, and, I'll, and also, thanks for following me on Twitter. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're hilarious. Thank you. Also, I need more Billy Wimsat and Kamau Bell high school stories. <laughs> <laughs> Mine are pretty uh, boring. Uh, Billy's got the exciting ones. But uh, Next, I want to bring on uh, from the uh, Black Voters Matter, Latasha Brown and Cliff Albright. Hello, Cliff. How are you doing, sir? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, so is, is, I was, um, is Latasha joining us? Uh, she's, I think she's on. Okay, well, you know, there's a lot going on out here in this world, so. <laughs> She's gonna make an entrance. Okay, well, that's, it's always good to have a dramatic entrance, so I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna be mad about that. But, uh, so first of all, just talk to us about uh, Black Voters Matter. What does your organization do? Well, we're, we're a power building organization, right? We, we believe in building power in Black communities, and one of the things we always say is that elections are one way of doing that, but it's not the only way of doing that. And so that's and that's fundamental to our approach, because the way that we go about doing the work that we do is by partnering with local groups. We believe in the power of local infrastructure, um, those community groups that, like Vince was kind of talking about, that have been doing this work 365 days out of the year and just not getting the kind of support that they need. We believe that those organizations exist and that they have assets and they have skills and that they need to be seeded into and, and supported and connected. And so that's the way we go about doing our work and we do it with groups that sometimes look a little bit different. Like sometimes it's an NAACP chapter. Sometimes it's a church. Sometimes it's a fraternity or a sorority. Sometimes it's a, a youth group, uh, a senior citizens group, a group that's focusing on healthcare, or maybe a group that's focusing on police violence. The commonality is that they have to have authentic relationships in our community and they have to have a deep interest in building power in our communities. As long as they have those prerequisites, we ready to get down with them. Well, that's, I think that's important to know because I just feel like a lot of times uh, we don't associate all these activist groups as working together. There sort of seems to be sometimes there's a feeling maybe from the past of like, we do our work over here, you do work, your work over there. But talk about, uh, just speak more on the importance of like really working together for a common goal. 
Yeah, you know, and it's 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 really rooted. You know, it's 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 by issue that groups work on, and we need to come together. But something that we say, we say, Black voters matter everywhere. Key to our work in every state where we do our work, and we do our work in up to thirteen states. But key to our work is that we believe that it takes like a statewide strategy, something which, by the way, Stacey Abrams also believed in. But we believe, and part of this is based on our experience in Alabama. Some folks may have remembered we were one of the organizations that mobilized Black voters back in 2017 with that Doug Jones, Roy Moore election, right? The fact of the matter is that that election couldn't have been won if it was just about Birmingham or, or Mobile or Montgomery. It took those Black Belt counties, right? Those counties which collectively, their votes basically amount to a whole nother city. And so in Georgia, uh, it's the same principle, right? You can't change Georgia. What just happened in this election cycle could not just happen with Metro Atlanta. It took Metro Atlanta, but it also took those mid-sized cities of Savannah and Columbus and Augusta and Macon. Um, and it also took those rural areas, you know, uh, Southwest Georgia, places that were hit hard by coronavirus. It takes that kind of a collective strategy in order to make this state be what it needs to be. And it's the same like that in all the other states. You can't make Louisiana be what it needs to be by only focusing on New Orleans. And you can't make Michigan be what it needs to be by only focusing on Detroit, right? It takes all those other cities up there in Michigan. It's the same thing with, with, with Georgia, that we had to connect all these different parts of the, of the state and invest in these local groups, sometimes groups that, you know, they've, they've, they've never seen a candidate bus come into their community, but they got to see what we call the blackest bus in America come rolling through. Um, and, and when it rolls through, people sometimes, we've literally had people break down in tears, crying and tell us, we, we didn't think that folks remembered us here. We didn't think that people thought that it was important to come here. And when you bring a big old bus like that and then resources and, and signs and, and push cards and all that, how many times have you heard come out, have, have you heard people be frustrated because they want to support a candidate but they can't get materials. Mm. I don't know where to get the yard signs. I don't know, I don't, there's no materials, there's no push cards. And so we make it a priority to go to places that oftentimes get left out, that don't get those materials, that don't get, that don't get the door knocks, that don't get the text message, and certainly don't get a big old black bus coming in our community. We make it a priority to, to go there and let folks know that they matter, that they are loved, and that they have power. And it seems like a big part of that has been like awakening people's sort of like excitement about participating in voting and participating in the process. I mean, you know, I think in a way that like those voters weren't being spoken to, black voters weren't being sort of, you know, there's sort of the idea of like they'll, they will either vote or not vote, but they weren't being talked to about here's the power of the moment and, and here's how you can engage in this. And also understanding that like, it's not about voting in this election, it's about voting, you know? Right, right, it, and, and, and it's, about, it's about voting and it's about participating in whatever ways folks want to participate or whatever ways folks are able to participate. Because one of the things we always say is like when we, you know, you probably heard people say, you know, if you don't vote, you don't count. That's damaging. Because what do you say to the person who's been disenfranchised and they can't vote? So they don't count. They don't have a role to play. Right. What we what we say is everybody's got a role to play, whether you whether you're going to vote or whether you're not even able to vote, you still got a role to play. Sometimes folks that are disenfranchised, they turn out to be our best organizer. When you let them know that they've got a role to play and that they've still got power. But when we minimize our power to only the vote, and don't get me wrong, the vote is important. But yeah. when we tell folks that that is your only legitimate way to participate, and as if like being on the streets all spring and all summer is not a legitimate way of building power, then that's, that's not being honest with our folks. Because what we know is, that energy in the streets is largely what led to the kind of turnout that we saw in this election cycle. In fact, one of the things I wanna lift up right here in Georgia, we're talking about Georgia flipping the blue and Joe Biden winning in Georgia, but there's a story in Brunswick, Georgia, which some people may remember is the, is the area where Ahmaud Arbery was murdered. And there was a district attorney that the first district attorney that refused to take action, tried to bury the case, tried to send it off to somebody else, that district attorney was on the ballot. Her name is Jackie Johnson. And guess what? Jackie Johnson is now out of a job. She about to lose her job, right? She <laughs> no longer has a job because the folks in that district, largely off of the energy that, that came out of that protest movement, voted her out. And so what we saw here in Georgia wasn't even just about the top of the ticket. We saw that victory. We've seen sheriff victories. We've seen uh, Black women become district attorneys. We've seen victories all up and down the ballot because folks who were building power 
through one form of energy and protest, we're able to shift that and merge it with an electoral strategy. And that's how we got the wins that we got all up and down the ballot in Georgia. Thank you, Cliff. I'm gonna bring in Latasha Brown. There's a lot of there's a lot of excitement for you, Latasha, in the chat. <laughs> I don't want people to think that that I'm ignoring you. So bring in let's bring in Latasha Brown. And have have you speak on this for a few minutes? So I, th I mean, I think that Cliff said, you know, part of what our philosophy is. I do think that part of what is important is for us to really recognize this is really about the spirit of people. That fundamentally, what we're doing, even with the work that we're we're building, this isn't just about participation. This is about power that this is about power to the extent that folks have agency so that we can make a difference in terms of our communities, what it is that we want to see, how do we shape leadership, you know, how we move forward. And so part of the work that we're doing is really about building ourselves up from the ground up, not just participating. When we're talking about voting, as Cliff said earlier, when we're talking to folks about voting, we're not trying to convince people to believe in us in the system necessarily. We're trying to get people to believe in themselves and their agency. That at the end of the day, if people believe in their own power, they will only accept certain things to be governed, right? When we look at what happened last night in Michigan, that would not have happened except the folks rose up and were like, wait a minute, y'all not just gonna steal our vote, right? This sounds fine and you got to, and they had to change because when people feel a sense of their power and a sense of their agency, they demand differently and folks have to respond to that. And so I think that part of our work in terms of, you know, there, there are a couple of things that Cliff said um, that I just want to reiterate around our model around building infrastructure, around be, building out the ecosystem. You know, we're not empire builders. You won't see a Black Voters Matter chapter, even though we do have a couple of folks who have been insistent upon, we've got Black Voters Matter chapters. We're like, no, we don't, right? Because the goal <laughs> isn't for us to be, to create a chapter and then now we've got to be focused on feeding ourselves. Our model is who is on the front line? There's always infrastructure in a community, always. You know, even when you look at the time in, in terms of an enslavement of Africans in this country, there was always a way to move information in spite of slavery. There was always a way of moving food and resources in spite of slavery, right? And so there's always an infrastructure that exists in the community. It doesn't matter where that community is. The goal is if you tap into that power base, if you tap into though we we all know the the sisters who live down on the side of the street the old lady live on the side of the street that know everything happening in the neighborhood right we know the corner store that you go to that where you get information right who can tell you where every dead body is right we know the folks who when somebody's in trouble or their house is caught on fire who is going to show up to provide resources for them that's the power in our community and so if we're actually helping to invest in that infrastructure to help build that out, to help coordinate where people are working. You know, the way that we saw, you know, when, when you're looking at power and political power, I'll say this just quickly, that you're looking at normally it's either political candidates or political parties. Instead, what we wanted to do is reframe the, the political landscape. And that fundamentally what you know is that Black Voters Matter became our campaign. Our candidate was power was black power that instead of being connected to necessarily a particular candidate or a particular party, that for us, it is engaging people in a process of their agency and where their own power, that's what they're exerting and that's what they're actually utilizing. So that's why our model, even in this last election cycle, we were able to support over 600 um, black led grassroots groups in the spectrum of which Cliff raised in Georgia alone, we worked in over 50 counties that we were very intentional from the beginning around working in the black belt that there had to be a connection of the urban and the rural connection that one that there were urban centers that we are in and so you've got to be there but you also have folks that have been pushed out of many of these cities and are living in the um, suburban areas or even have selected or to live in, in rural areas or areas that are considered rural areas. So what happens when you're making that connectivity, when you're building out the ecosystem? And so that's what our work is rooted in. That's what the work has been rooted in in Georgia that for us, elections are just not, elections in itself. If you're just doing election work, that's very transactional. 
Our goal is to be transformative. We are trying to transform the entire political landscape in this country. We want to see something different. We believe that people deserve something different. Children don't deserve to be in cages, right? Women don't deserve to be able to, to have hysterectomies when they're sex seeking refuge. People don't need to be shot in the back right, or killed just because of who they are, their skin color, right? And so fundamentally, our work is really a larger context that is that supersedes party or political affiliation. This literally is rooted in how do we center power around people power so that we are literally impacting and shifting and transforming the political landscape. So that's our work. Thank you for that. that first of all, I was to say preach. I was give some of this, give me some of this. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, the people, so first of all, a lot of people are trying to donate right now to the link and you're having trouble getting through. That just means there's a lot of people probably donating. Please be patient. Uh, I would also ask you, Latasha, people are also that's asking exciting. you, what'd you say? I said, that's exciting. <laughs> that is exciting, yeah. Well you, well, you just gave a sermon. So people are trying to put some money in the collection plate. <laughs> That's the Baptist in me, I guess. <laughs> yes, well, that's why, that's why I like that Southern Baptist. I come from that. I should be clear. I have Alabama ties. My dad lives in Mobile, Alabama. So, uh, well, I'm from Mobile, Alabama originally. Oh, Somebody, really? We we might be related then. We might be cousins. <laughs> hey, cuz. Hey, cuz. <laughs> people are asking for, like, right now, people are being fired up, but they also, like, people are trying to donate. What else can people do? What would you say, people who are like, I want to help? What can I do? What should, I, what should my charge be? So I know I know there's a, a couple of things. I'll just say something quickly and then um, Cliff, I we'll, we'll come back to this later too. So okay. So I, I mean I think on, on there's a short term and a long term because I do want people, this is part of what my my um what I want us to really get rooted in. And so I'll just say that there's short term and there's long term. One, I want people to get rooted in this idea that our problems did not start with Trump and they're not gonna end with Trump out of office. So let's start there, right? There are 30 million people who are living in poverty right now. There's a whole lot of work that needs to be done. And so I'm raising that because I am hoping that we just don't see this election, right? As okay, we're gonna get involved in Georgia and then we're gonna go back to our lives. That fundamentally what I hope is that in this process, people really are transformed, that they are seeing how can they help? Because fundamentally, I guarantee you that even in our own communities, that when we're talking about, yes, we got to deal with the Senate, but we fun, there, we got some major problems in every single state in this country, right? And so I think one of the ways to help right now, and I'm so glad that my sister Inse, our leader raised it, is that you know, part of what I think is helpful is to be able to support organizers on the ground and literally be able to take lead from those organizations, those groups that are on the ground that are doing work. You know, I don't think that it is in um, to, 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 to jump up and, and have a whole bunch of people to run in, run, you know, on one hand in my, you know, one hand, I love people and I miss people because of COVID-19, but it can be really overwhelming, especially when we're already stretched. And so what I think would be actually helpful is that if people, there are so many ways that people can work from home, that part of what changes, and you all know this, is not just, you know, I always bring up Brown versus the Board of Education was 1954. Most schools were not desegregated to 1970s. Part of it is there's also political will. You have to shift the political discussion and what is happening. And so part of being able to do that is whatever platforms that you all have, there's a couple of things you know, one, let me let me just go through a couple of this quick things. One, support an organization, giving dollars works. Let me tell you why it works. Not just, even if you give $5, Cliff will tell you, we, we have gotten, we've gotten probably over 100,000 unique um, donations. But one of the donations that he and I will never forget came in Pritchard, Alabama, where there was a young woman that walked up to us with a handful of change right, and handed us, we were on the street corner uh, uh, campaigning, and she handed us a handful of change and said, this is what I got. And then she went back and got a card and used $10 and gave us $10 because what her money did, the energy behind her money, it was affirmation. It was, I want to be a part of this. I believe in what you're doing. And so what I am saying is even if you can't send a you know, a uh, 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 thousand dollars, like literally, even if you got a hundred dollars, you send it to three different organizations, $10 a piece, that sending resources to organizations that are on the ground fighting make, says that you are, you're standing with us. It makes us feel affirmed. It makes us feel like we need resources as well, but more than anything is the energy and the love behind that. So I would just encourage you all to take resources 
you know, to literally be able to fund some of the work, give resources to MVP. MVP has done an excellent job at being able to spread around the love. They have, they have just been excellent stewards of the resources. So that's one way. The second way is that from phone banking to postcarding, that there are ways to engage in collective work collective ways to volunteer that I do think that makes a difference as well, right? Those phone calls can actually be more powerful, in my opinion, than even talking about going door to door because we are in the middle of a pandemic. Like COVID-19 is still here with us. And so we have to be very careful and cautious around that. I think another way for us to do is really be able, if you have platforms, to really be able to lift this in your platform in a way of, we cannot allow this race to become too nationalized. And what I mean by this is this can't be the um, come on Georgia save us. This has to be around. This has to be rooted in the folks in this state have been suffering, y'all. That in this state, our state has refused to expand Medicaid. Our state has closed a hospital in the middle of a pandemic in a rural area. Our state has, when you're looking at um, um, when you're looking at our governor and the lack of leadership from our governor, when you look at 200,000 people who have been dropped from the voting rolls, who never should have been dropped from the voting rolls um, and, and have been subjected to voter suppression, my point is there are challenges within the state. So really to sit to, to actually create a message that encourages Georgia folks to stand in their power to change circumstances for themselves will be far more helpful than just a message to say, come on, Georgia, save us. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing that I'll say is, and well, anyway, I'm, I, 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 I wanna turn it over to Cliff. Um, the last thing that I'll say is, and this is the, um, my aunt says the California woo-woo part of me, right? Even though I'm from Alabama, I am straight deep South country Southern, right? You know, um, but it is the spirit side of me that I do believe that, collective work and responsibility work, but I do believe that we have to, like when you're when people believe and we operate in that belief and there is a spirit of love. And I know that sounds whatever, but I promise you everything in my spirit feels that, that fundamentally we have to really be committed. We have to recommit ourselves to this process, not just to this election these next two months, right? Because if we're gonna come down in Georgia next two months and go back to our communities and go back where it was, I mean, what's, what's the point, right? But if we can let this moment really be able to, like, what is life saying to us right now? Like, how can we use the spirit, the momentum, the energy of this moment to really radically reimagine every single system that we have and to really lift up that conversation? And so while we're talking about helping Georgia, what also happens is that we don't step over those communities and what we can do and build in our own communities as well so that we're actually building towards something. So that after January the 5th, we're on to the next piece or really the work is not going to end. It has to go forward. So I just want to put that out there because I don't want I, I, I don't want us to miss the opportunity of what I think life is showing us right now. This is a transformative moment. And so there is a question for us of how are we going to be transformed in this moment and how are our actions going to really be rooted in, we've got to transform this entire political process because something is fundamentally wrong when you got folks talking about, we're not going to count votes from Detroit. They got to go, y'all. You know, and that's, that, if, if we have time, I just, real quick, I just wanted to piggyback on that because, you know, we talk a lot about love and power. And, um, and when we talk about love, you know, one of the things that I always like to talk about is remind people what, what Dr. King had said when he said, you know, that, that power without love is reckless and abusive but love without power is sentimental and anemic, right? And we don't need a sentimental and anemic kind of love. Latasha just mentioned what, was, what almost happened in Wayne County last night. And there's a lot of things that kept that from, from, from going the wrong way. You had a lot of voters that reached out. You had people going on social media. But one of the things that many of y'all may have seen a video of Brother Ned, right? Is that his name, Ned? I think Ned is the, the, the other commissioner, right? That went viral because he basically read them the riot act, right? He just called them out. He kept calling their names. He kept telling how wrong. He went as far, he ended by saying, when you meet your maker, your soul is going to be warm, right? And so, you know, Ned, 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 was, was a, Ned was a whole mood when he gave that whole talk, right? And some people may say that Ned was mad or Ned was angry or Ned was this and that. Ned was acting out of a spirit of love, right? That's right. Because in a spirit of love, we've got to hold folks accountable. And so I think that part of what everybody on this call can do is that in the spirit of both love and power, there are two things that I would ask. One is that we not be afraid 
to call those out that are doing wrong, right? That we have the courage to speak the, and to not be fearful that we're gonna be hateful or that is that is that is um, being out of anger. It's out of a spirit of love that we hold folks accountable. I love my child and I hold my child accountable out of that love, right? And so being willing to call that out is an act of love. But the other piece of that love is never doubting that the path that we on is a righteous path, right? Never doubting, because there's a lot of noise that gets in the way. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of disinformation. It's easy for you, you know, Kamal, you asked and say earlier about how you felt on election night when those numbers weren't coming in. And even some of us that knew the strategy, that right. knew that the votes were gonna come in later on, we were still kind of worried, right? Never doubt y'all that the path that you are on and the causes that we are supporting are righteous causes and that you are on the right path and that you are doing the right thing and that you're doing it out of a spirit of love. And as long as we can remember that, then it's easy for us to see our way through all the noise and through the darkness and through all the confusion. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Thank you, Latasha. Uh, I don't know if you're not fired up after that. I don't know what to tell y'all out there. Maybe you need to get to a doctor and have them check your pulse because uh, <laughs> that was a, was a lot of truth we just heard. Uh, I'm going to bring on uh, Layla Ali from Movement Voter Project. Layla, come on, come out here with me. Hey. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am absolutely blown away. Um, I don't know how I can follow all of that any of that. <laughs> I'm already inspired. I'm ready to do what I can do um, to support our partner organizations on the ground in Georgia. Well, I think that's the important thing to talk about is, is the, the partner organizations on the ground. What, can you name some of the groups that are on the ground or groups that are that some of the smaller groups that are that are doing a lot of the work that does not get heralded? Absolutely. And I'm so excited uh, to bring that kind of um, work and share what our partner organizations are doing on the ground. I just want to first say that I feel so grateful and empowered to be sharing space tonight with Ense, Latasha, and Cliff. Y'all are truly my heroes and heroes and are leading with so much compassion, grace, and intentionality to really create lasting change for our communities in Georgia. And I also want to shout out and thank the more than 700 people that joined us tonight at 9 p.m. Um, I'm definitely wide awake, although it's close to my bedtime, but I just wanted to let y'all know that your un unconditional support of the leadership and organizing that's happening in Georgia is, is very heard and seen. Um, and, you know, we, we even with the impactful victory for organizing, organizers in Georgia that we all witnessed, um, many of our leaders, as we heard tonight on the ground, know that, the fi that this fight is just beginning. Um, you know, this is a really powerful and historic moment uh, for collaboration among organizations who are working to build progressive power, not just in 2020, but beyond that, but then, you know, the next five and 10 and 20 years. Uh, we heard from New Georgia Project Action Fund and Black Voters Matter about their fabulous, fabulous work. And I also want to take um, this time to really bring y'all to the field for a bit and shout out and name some of the other work that's being led by the over four, by the over 25 partner organizations we work with and that are holding it down powerfully in more than 38 counties across the state. Um, many of our partner groups are working to win uh, Warnock and Ossoff's uh, their Senate seats and secure progressive power in the Senate to lead strong fights when it comes to climate justice, health care, and reproductive justice, protect voting rights, and support Black and Brown immig immigrant communities. And in coalition with the America Votes Table, our partner organizations uh, like Black Male Voter Project, Poder Latinx, the Asian American Advocacy Fund and Georgia Shift Action are phone banking, text banking, and sending out mailers to register 65,000 new black and brown voters um, and reach 1.7 million voters to get out the vote this January. They're working all over the state in Metro Atlanta counties like Fulton, DeKalb, Cobb and Gwinnett, as well as black counties like Henry, Richmond, Bibb and Chatham. And um, our partner organizations are also engaging very deeply and intentionally in various immigrant and faith communities. Organizations like Mihente and GLAR Action Network are working together to run a statewide campaign targeting 100,000 Latinx voters on the ground and uh, on the doors and 130,000 on phones and text messages. And the Asian American Advocacy Fund is, Fund is engaging with over 1 million Asian and South Asian voters through text, mail, door-to-door -door canvassing and ethnic specific media. And they're all constantly reminding me, which I, I truly appreciate of the importance of filling in language education and information gaps 
that um, we know that our communities can't exclude and our work cannot hold. Um, Mi gente, Glar, and Poder Latinx are actively addressing these challenges by creating bilingual mail pieces and digital and radio campaigns targeting Spanish speaking voters. And the Asian American Advocacy Fund is producing vote by mail videos and organizing voter assistance hotlines in seven to 10 different Asian languages, which is absolutely incredible. Um, we're also supporting groups like Song Power, a group that is leading a multiracial Black-led strategy to really build a base of pro-Black, pro-queer, pro-trans, pro-Latinx, and pro-worker. They're organizing car rallies and canvassing in local neighborhoods in 10 counties across Georgia, where they are leading mutual aid projects while also getting out the vote for the election. And the very beautiful thing about our strategy here at MVP is that we honor, we're creating space and supporting the power and infrastructure that is being built by the small, young and emerging local and grassroots groups that we believe are lifting important work in their communities and using this moment to grow their base and impact. These groups include nonprofit civic engagement organizations like Eco Womanist, that's led by Black women working in the Black Belt counties of the state and turning out voters for the Senate runoff and the Public Service Commission race to really organize around the issues of affordable housing, housing and against increased utility rates that are that we're seeing pushing out people um, out of their homes. We're also supporting the work of Georgia Muslim Voter Project and Care Georgia to create a Muslim coordinating body that, that's been um, working for years to organize over 65,000 Muslim Americans across the state. We are building relationships with coalition partners of groups like the Latino Community Fund, one which is finally able to pay their staff who have been turning out voters for over 16 years who have been working as unpaid volunteers. I can honestly go on and talk for hours about the work of our partners in Georgia and what I'm learning and the blueprint, blueprint that I believe is really being created in the state for others to follow. Um, and I just wanted to say, yeah, I'm not from Georgia. Um, I live and organize in North Carolina and I know the work it takes to organize in the South. Um, I totally get it when my friend Mondell at uh, Black Male Voter Project, sending a huge sh shout out to them, says to me, Layla, COVID-19 is making you know, our work super hard, organizing really hard. And I totally feel that. But he says, but the way to win and get our people to the polls is by going to neighborhoods and having intentional face-to-face -face conversations. So we need support to do this in creative ways and keep our people safe. Or when I'm talking to Amer at, at the Georgia Muslim Voter Project, he's like, we're building power in communities that have for, for too long not been invested in. We can't show up at just one or two mosques, right? We, we wanna create a civic engagement infrastructure in the Muslim community, which means we have to be at mosques and Islamic centers across the state with the information our communities need to submit mail-in ballots or look up their polling site information. And if I haven't been clear with all that I shared, I really wanna be clear that this moment we're living in is the result of the hard work and leadership of, of leaders like Ense, Latasha, Cliff, Mondale, Omer, and so many other black and black brown leaders whose names we know and those who we don't know um, that have fought against the toughest opposition and voter suppression like, like was shared today, canvassed one of the most deadly COVID-19 hotspots and helped the way in which we saw helped out 4 million Georgian voters in the last election. So I've seen the ways in which Movement Voter Project um, has trusted in the imagination and vision of our partner groups for building power in Georgia, which has allowed us to invest early and support their work. And I think just like we were smart to invest in Georgia from the beginning, we wanna be twice as smart and make sure our groups have the money and resources they need to immediately you know, flip the US Senate. And more importantly, which I think is super important and, and what we've been hearing on the call today is be able to build that sustainable, um, you know, build sustainable movements that, are, that we know are designed to transform power across the state. So I'll, I'll end there. Sorry, it's a, it was a long answer to your question, but I hope it gives folks a picture of what's happening and what I'm learning from groups on the ground in Georgia. Yes, yes. I mean, it was it was a it was the perfect answer from the chat. The answer was great. I think one of the things that you talked about in there is, and I want you to just talk a little more about this about just the importance of of multiracial building power, the way in which we're building power. That I think a lot of people see the South as bl just black and white. You know what I'm saying? Or or just or just Christian and going to hell. You know what I mean? So talk about the the fact that the the, the all these groups coming from different backgrounds building power together. Absolutely. And it's so beautiful and powerful to see 
the ways in which um, these multiracial groups are working together in solidarity and the ways in which they're collaborating and coordinating across, across the state. Like I mentioned before, we have groups like Georgia Muslim Voter Project um, that's working in collaboration with CARE Georgia, for example, and creating this Muslim coordinating body that just doesn't exist, really. It's a place that um, they're creating and a space they're creating to bring together Muslim leadership and um, create a place for visioning for the Muslim community that we haven't seen before. And they, and they haven't been able to do that in over three years. And it's super powerful to see in which they're working with the groups from, from the table um, and groups that are carrying different identities and work to see that kind of um, being laid out in the community. And we're seeing, you know, like organizations that I mentioned before, like the Asian Advocacy Fund that are creating hotlines in over 10 languages. That's absolutely powerful. They're, they're recognizing and seeing the need of not excluding people in our community and, and knowing that our work cannot hold that, that we cannot move forward collectively, that we cannot envision this collective future uh, for our people without being able to bring all of our people and all of our communities together and making sure that they have the resources and information they need to really be building that progressive power that we're seeing in this state. So, you know, the, and, and this hotline, what I'm learning about this hotline that the Asian American Advocacy Fund is setting up is that they're, they're going out making sure that people know how to, how to submit their ballots, how to register to vote, how to complete the voting process, which is super powerful to see, and are, are located in counties where we've, we've seen those major wins, like those local wins. Uh, for example, the sheriff races that they were able to flip in Georgia this past election, that um, is paving the way for the, the cancellation of 287G agreements that have been you know, completely dangerous and have created so much harm for our, not only our immigrant communities, but our black communities as well. Um, and so it's, it's really powerful to see not only these groups taking the lead and making sure that we are, are, are building power and creating this sense of agency that Latasha was talking about in Cliff for all folks in our community, but in a way that's coordinated, strategic, intentional, um, that is, you know, being led by grace and compassion and meeting people where they're at to build that kind of power is, is just absolutely remarkable. It blows me away all the time. Thank you, Layla. Let's bring everybody else back in. Latasha, Cliff, and Inse uh, have a little bit of a roundtable discussion with the time discussion with the time we have left. I also will be looking in the chat for uh, the Q and A. So uh, let's bring everybody back in. Make sure you unmute yourself. It's a lot of powerful words we're hearing right now, a lot of people talking, and I'm going to uh, start bringing it back to Ensei. So a lot of people are still asking in the chat, what can I do to help? <laughs> so like, And I think we know that people are donating in the chat, which is great. Uh, but there's questions about like, if I want to phone bank or text or text bank, I, how do I do that? And also, some people are actually asking in the Q&A, aren't people in Georgia tired of getting phone calls from people they don't know to ask them about voting? They're worried about like talking people out of voting because they're just bothered too much by all the activism. And say, can you speak on that? Yeah, I don't think that's a thing. Uh, I don't think that that's a thing. Uh, I mean, like, yeah, we're gonna be annoying in this moment because that's how much it matters, right? Um, so here's what people need to know. There are about 23,000 Georgians that are turning 18 uh, between November 3rd and January 5th. Those folks need to be registered uh, to be added to the voter rolls. There's like 35,000 formerly incarcerated people who are eligible to vote and need to be registered. Um, I think that you know our, our, our siblings to the South in Florida uh, with Amendment 4 in 2018 uh, helped to restore the voting rights of formerly incarcerated people. And um, that is, you know, that is a possibility that 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 in Georgia, um, once you're what they say off paper, uh, once you've satisfied the terms of your sentence, you are allowed to register to vote. And we need to make sure that people know that, um, that they know what the power is. I think that we're having a kickoff on Saturday, the 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern time uh, to like let volunteers know how they can lead in. I'm gonna drop the uh, chat or drop the uh, link in the chat to RSVP uh, for the voter, the volunteer kickoff and we're welcoming all the people. Uh, phone calls, text messages will also be knocking on doors. They'll be physically distanced. We have consulted tons of 
public health experts. Um, and so, yeah, this is definitely the moment. I, again, I don't think that um, we have to compete, you know, with corporations that are trying to uh, get into the black by the end of the year, right? So Black Friday and people selling stuff. Um, again, the holidays and all of the chatter and all of the ads uh, that come as that come with that. Um, and so, uh, having people help us cut through the noise and communicate to Georgians how important their vote is in this matter, uh, in this moment. I also think that we didn't really go into it, but um, this feels like it's for the whole, the, the whole kit and caboodle, the whole ball game. Um, I think that, you know, what we saw in November was tons of voter suppression, again, voter intimidation, that it was diffuse and it was spread across 50 states in DC and Puerto Rico. This is it. But like, there are two U.S. Senate seats on the ballot. Um, and so desperate people tend to do desperate things. And so, as we brace for impact and prepare for some very desperate Republicans to figure out how they can regain or how they can hold on to control in the Senate, that it's going to be people of conscience, people of goodwill, um, people who are committed to progress that help us remind Georgians how their votes matter in this moment. Uh, I just want to open this up. How do we also deal with the fact that people sort of a lot of people who maybe just got registered to vote maybe think voting happens once every four years. And to, to sort of, how do we deal with the fact that like turnout is a big issue on, especially with special elections? How do we, how do people on this call who want to participate and how are you all planning on dealing with that? I'll, uh, Cliff, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it just takes, it means having those conversations, right? It means, it means being annoying, right? I agree completely with what and say said, you know, people get annoyed. I, I was just saying to somebody earlier, all my family's phones are in my name. So I get all the text messages that are directed to my two college age sons, they come to me. So I'm very annoyed and I do this work for a living, but I don't know anybody, including myself, who's gonna be like, that doggone New Georgia project sent me another text. Now I'm not gonna vote. Or now I'm gonna vote for Trump because of that new damn you and say who fought. Right? I don't know anybody who's doing that because the reality is in our communities, we've been without contact for so long. We've been forgotten. We've been underestimated. We've been undercounted, right? We haven't been getting a flood of text messages like that. We haven't been getting door knocks. And in some parts of our community, we're still not getting those door knocks. And so far from um, people being so annoyed that they're just gonna tune out. They might be annoyed, but part of them also feels like, oh, I must mean something, right? If people, if people are taking this much time to send me this number of text messages, then maybe I mean something. And that process is a part of what's going to make people um, remember or, or be aware that yes, there is another election, that no, our job's not, not over, and that we gotta come on back out. It's going to take that kind of messaging by text, by phone, radio, um, um, influencers, comedians like a W. Cabal Bell, right? Uh, it's gonna take <laughs> it's gonna take all of that to to let people know. Hey, wait a minute, something must still be going on. Like all those commercials that I was so tired of in October, November, they're still going on. Guess what? There's still an election, so it's gonna take all this work, and that's what at the end of the day, and it's gonna take everybody having these conversations with each other. We always say everybody we touch we try to turn into an organizer. Everybody we touch, we tell them, you've got to go out and get your 10. Go out, go out and get 10 more people. Everybody's got somebody in their family, their friends, their coworkers, somebody they like, somebody they don't like. Everybody's got somebody in their circle right now. If I pick up my phone and I go through 10 random contacts on my phone, and a lot of folks on my phone are activists, but if I pick 10 random folks on my phone, three of them either aren't registered or they didn't vote, guaranteed, right? Those are the folks that we need everybody to reach out to. Reach out to get your 10 in your circle. And if everybody does that, then everybody will know there's an election. Everybody will know what the issues are that are at stake. And everybody will know that they need to come on out. Somebody asked in the chat, what do we do about the misinformation out there? Like some people have said that their parents thought that they, somebody told them that Biden was coming to do this and da da da, and that's why they have to vote for 45. I'm not even gonna say what the da 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 was because I don't wanna put more misinformation out there. But Latasha, what do we do with the fact that a lot of this is, is actually take, is actually giving people, how do you give people correct information when they have all this flood of misinformation? 
we have to empower organizations that are credible um, messengers like New Georgia Project, like Black Voters Matter, like Georgia Stand Up. At the end of the day, communities that see us, they're going to listen to us, right? Um, because they see us not just when it's election time. I'm raising this because oftentimes even the communications is a matter of who has access to resources to get the information out. And that so fundamentally, it, particularly in the South, you know, something that that Ince said earlier it reminds me of, you know, as we were saying, oh, it's Trump. I'm like, we live with Trump every day. There's so many Trumps running around <laughs> um, um, in, in the deep South. And there is those of us who are seasoned activists the, the misinformation campaigns that has been a that that is a part of the process part of what winds up happening unfortunately part of what winds up happening is the groups that can actually combat that who are the credible messengers don't have the same level of capital or resources and so i think it's really important and it's important who the message comes from for example i always say this that i can we can look any of the three of us can you can put us down and watch tv we can tell you an ad for georgia that was made by somebody that lives doesn't live in georgia right we can tell by the by the uh, by the the setup of the conversation. We can tell by the draw. The way they say y'all, we're like mm -mm, they from the south, right? We can we can just tell by the way they say y'all. We can say we can tell by the, the the bottom line is what winds up happening is I think it's going to be really important. I think in this way the, the way for us to combat it, um, one is we do have to call it out, but one we have to strengthen the capacity and be able to resource those groups that are credible messengers. Because if we get to folks first, our goal is if, they, if we get to them first, or not even to them first, if we get the resources to be able to actually be able to dispel that, to be able to get the correct information, off, that's going to make the difference, right? And so the, the challenge is oftentimes there's a gap between we're coming up against well-resourced, well-oiled machine who are putting millions and millions and millions of dollars just to flood bad information. And so I think one of the ways to offset that, and the, we've seen that, is that when we are actually empowering credible groups, which is part of our model, uh, while we're working with different organizations in those local communities, and those local communities that they, they've got credible leaders that we can actually, incredible messengers that can actually be able to combat that. So I think that that's one of the best ways to be able to do that, to empower the messengers. Thank can you. I add real quick? Sure. I forgot to give the on our page, blackvotersmatterfund.org. There's a take action link, and under there, there's a volunteer link. You can fill out that volunteer form, text banking, phone banking, postcarding, all of that. Folks can get involved um, through all that. So, again, blackvotersmatterfund.org on the take action link. Um, what what do we do and i want to open it up to everybody to combat the idea that pe the just the idea that low voter turnout especially with this you know when, even when i heard i was like oh when's the georgia runoff january 5th that's before the inauguration like you know like like i was even shocked by how quick it was what do you do to combat that this is open up to the whole there's one, there's, there's one word for that work we gotta work <laughs> we, we gotta organize that the way that you come back voter uh, suppression is you better get some turnout. And so I think part of it, um, I, I do want to uh, uh, offer uh, what happened in Alabama. I want to just as a case point in 2017, we knew that was a one little slice opportunity. Alabama is a solid, 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 has been a solid Republican state forever, but we coming for them. We coming for them. So don't worry about it. We coming for them. They next. Um, after South Carolina, I think we're going to South Carolina next, right, Cliff? We're going to turn South Carolina next. Um, and then Mississippi, then we're going to get to Alabama. Alabama's going to take a little work. But nevertheless, um, I, you know, in that race, we knew that there was a particular opening. One, you, we had a, a, there was a particular opening to be able to, because to, normally, I mean, that's a seat that's hard to, to hold on to. Uh, but in that space, this was in the middle of December. Um, anybody that's from, I know that there are people here that are not from the South, but anybody that is from the deep South know that snow is IE for kryptonite in the South. Like when it snows, when the threat of snow, we shut down, there's a wrap, right? <laughs> and so um, in the middle, this is December the 13th, 
it had the audacity to snow in Alabama and it was the kind of snow that stuck. And then we'd never have snow that can stick, right? And then it was like, it was like real snow, right? And it was on in the, this was two weeks before Christmas. I mean, it's just like the absolute worst possible circumstance you could have existed. Um, however, what you saw is because there was a concerted effort to message to black voters, because there were organizers and organizations that were funded and invested in. And I must let, I must give a shout out at this moment, MVP, the work that we did in Alabama would not have been would not have happened we would not be where we are if it if it had not been for mvp mvp was our first investor stuck with yeah. us and our largest investor right that gave us the opportunity so i just want to offer that that that's what happened with with uh, movement voter project that fundamentally in the absolute worst circumstance you could have you had a overperformance of black voters because the formula works if we're giving the kind of resources, the time to support, the formula can work. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to say that this is not going to be an uphill battle. This is an uphill battle. We are, yes, we're going to have to deal with voter suppression. Yes, we are going to have to deal with the culture where there's a major voting drop off. But yes, what I do know is that I know that sister in say, oof, I know how to get some folks out, right? And her organization. What I do know is I know that Cliff Albright can draw a map and tell you where all the, all the voters should be, where they be and what time they're gonna get, right? What I do know is there are capable folks and capable organizations that if we do have, if there is a shot, if you just give us a crack, right? If there is a shot, as it is, that there's a, a there is a wealth of expertise and infrastructure that has been built over time in Georgia, that with the right resources, we have a real shot. You know, we have a real, real shot. Probably the 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 and we've got momentum. We got wind under our wings. And so y'all know, like people have teams. I hate folks who, who keep check. I shouldn't say hate because I don't hate anybody, but people who change teams when the team win. Right, like, and they abandon their team because they're losing. Everybody, like everybody, likes to jump on a winning team, right? Uh -huh. And so there's a momentum when you're winning. So right now we've got the right amount of momentum. We've got a great ground game. We've got credible organizations on the ground. I think we're in the best possible position ever. If you had to ask me ten years ago if we could pull two Senate seats, I was like, mm, I don't know about that. I'm like, mm, we might. I mean, like, how are we gonna do that, right? Are the aliens gonna come help us, right? Yeah. But, but based on where we are right now, and in many ways, almost like the perfect storm, and what we've learned, and mistakes that we've made, that we have the absolute best opportunity. Um, and I, I don't want to minimize that it is going to be a heavy lift. But we do have the best opportunity. So that's that's what I would say. I just wanted to offer the Alabama piece because, and I mean fundamentally, let me say, I am I'm a black person from the deep south. If I didn't do stuff because it was hard, I would just like, I mean, I wouldn't even exist, right? <laughs> if I didn't go into stuff around saying what we could win, I would never win nothing because I would never try. Like we are built to be gladiators. That's who we are. Like our circumstances have made us gladiators. So at the end of the day, we're going to go where other folks say you can't go. And what we do is constantly um, surprise folks because the problem is we in this racist culture, people continuously underestimate our power and our intellect. And so I'm, I'm just saying in this space, this is a real opportunity. Right. And I'm just add that it is the nature of battleground state politics that you, it is a battleground that you are fighting for every vote. And so we're not going to perform, get out the vote, right? We're going to get out the vote, right? That we don't need people to perform as if they're doing everything that is required to win. We need to do everything that is required to win. That we don't pull up on our jumpers, right? That you follow it, that you see it all the way through. And that is what we're doing in this moment. Uh, I, just wanna, we just, I just got some real second cliff i just got some information Layla ali can you come back in here and let these people know uh how much money has been raised since we've been on this call yes drum roll i am super excited to share that we raised three hundred thousand dollars just on this call oh my god and we could not do that without having y'all in this space and sharing the amazing work that you're doing and I am here to listen and, and, and move in your direction. 
and support y'all um, and just say to everyone else that we need to trust in your imagination and vision for Georgia and the South. I love how we are just vibing all kinds of South out here in this call. Um, I rep the South really hard. So thank y'all so much. I really appreciate all of you and your work that you're doing on in Georgia and just bringing all of that in this space tonight. Absolutely. I just Can want to I say something quickly. Um, I, I, this is just, just on my spirit. That, you know, it's amazing to me that Republicans have go through so much effort to suppress the vote I'm raising that because in many ways, it seems like sometimes our opponent can see what we can't see. That like they understand the threat is there. They understand the possibility and the potential and the power. And oftentimes, you know, unless we see a, a win and we're like guaranteed it's gonna win and X, Y, Z, we can't see it. But, but isn't it kind of amazing that so much effort has gone into Georgia to suppress the vote? What is it that they see? What is it that they know? Yeah, I, I just wanted along the same lines, you know, when we're talking about, well, are people going to be able to turn out? I want folks to just think about, and, and, and say referenced this a little bit earlier, think about where we were two years ago at this time in Georgia. We had just mobilized and saying them just registered you know, half a million people and all of that and 800,000. And, and we had just mobilized all kinds of people and folks turned out, waited in lines, and we saw an election stolen right in front of our faces, just bold face, right in front of us. And all the questions that we got, I know I got it, I know Latasha got it, I know and say got it. People, reporters would ask, how are black voters gonna respond to this? Like, is this going to be a setback? Are people gonna be so discouraged that in the next cycle that they don't come back out? And what did black folks do? We responded in the midst of a pandemic after seeing an election stolen, we responded in record numbers and came out and did, got more votes than ever in this state and turned this state um, back to blue, right? And so we've already been through, how much more can we go through, right? And, 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 and folks still, still doubt. The, the, the amazing thing isn't, you know, isn't, um, the question isn't like whether or not we're gonna turn out in, in January 5th. The, the amazing thing is how is it that we have gotten to the point where we are in spite of everything that we've gone through and all the suppression and seeing the vote stolen and all the, all the hate and everything, how is it that we still stand and we still thrive and we still have the audacity to win stuff? That's what's so amazing about our folks. So when you, if you ask me what's gonna happen in January 5th, our folks are gonna respond the same way that we've already responded. And like everybody said, we got the momentum on, on, at our backs now and so I'm very confident, not naive, it's gonna be hard, but like Latasha and Ensei said, we're gonna get the work in and our folks are gonna respond. Uh, some people in the chat are asking, is there can people still register to vote in Georgia for the for the for the yes, Ensei? Yes, December 7th is the voter registration deadline. Like I said, the 23,000 Georgians that are turning 18, 35,000 formerly incarcerated folks that are coming off paper that have satisfied the terms of their sentence. People are moving to Georgia every day. Listen, I'm like, listen, uh, you know, traffic is terrible. <laughs> Go to Charlotte. I hear it's lovely this time. <laughs> But, but they're still moving to Georgia and, and we welcome them and we want to make sure that they get registered to vote. Uh, that's, that's a lot of shade out there. Riff Raff going to be coming after you and say. I know, I know. No, welcome. <laughs> Some people are asking about donating money to, uh, to, to organizations that raise money for TV commercials. Is that a place that is worth giving money to? Some people are saying that that the that the Republicans are spending five to one on TV ads. Is that a place that you see value in? I mean, I'll say this. Go ahead. Go on. Okay. I was just gonna say that there are multiple ways, like think about how much television you watch and then think about Netflix and YouTube and Spotify, right? And how, how often you're on Twitter and how often you're on Facebook. That this, in a battleground state, it is complete, it's a battle for eyeballs and ears and hearts and minds and attention. And so we are doing what we do. We are competing on multiple fronts, right? Um, and so I, uh, I question the wisdom of just TV, but we need to do battle there. And if there's some people who say, this is our lane, this is what we wanna do, um, a salute to them. 
All right. Uh, well, let's talk about the candidates a little bit. What? Let's talk two things: the candidates and also what is at stake if this if this election is not won. Who wants to take that one? And say, I think you should talk about the candidate since you have a really strong relationship. That was that was cute. <laughs> that was cute. <laughs> I mean, it's not a secret that uh, Reverend Warnock was our board chair for a number of years. And so, um, I mean, this is a moment. I think that there's an opportunity. Um, you know, he's the third person to lead from Martin Luther King's pulpit after he was murdered. Right. And that means something to a lot of folks. I think that Warnock has receipts, right, that he has taken a rest with poor folks in Georgia, was one of our Moral Monday leaders. Right. Um, you know, Health care is an extraordinarily huge issue. Like Latasha has touched on it. Cliff has touched on it. We're talking about 12 hospitals in rural Georgia that are about to close a hospital that closed a week before the election in the middle of a pandemic and we know that hospitals are not only the places where people go to heal to get well they're also they tend to be some of the largest employers in rural communities right so um, you know, we have elected officials who ha are, are in the middle of a pandemic trying to take our health care, the little bitty that we have in Georgia. And so I think that that is at stake. I think that what the people of Georgia are going to get with Raphael Warnock and with John Ossoff are folks who are accountable who know us, who know what our priorities are, who know what our hopes are, our fears are, and that who will listen, right? Who will pick up the phone. We don't elect messiahs. So I want to be super clear with everybody under the sound of my voice that we don't need a messiah, right? Because it's very easy to take that one person out. That we are looking for people who are, want, are, are open to, are willing, and are committed to co-governing with the people, right? That we're sending folks to Atlanta and we're sending folks to Washington, D.C., who are willing to co-govern, to take a people's agenda, to take a Black family, Black community agenda, to take a working family's agenda to Washington, D.C. and get the people's work done, right? Um, and so I think that that's important. I will also say, just, you know, because I'm a numbers girl, folks know this, um, that um, President Trump got 71% of the white vote in Georgia and still lost. Uh, so President-elect Biden won Georgia with 29% of the vote, right? We're looking at polling data that says Warnock is up, you know, 0.30, uh, plus 30 uh, in his positives. Uh, uh, Ossoff is plus 21 uh, in his positives. And so, you know, how many millennials are in the United States Senate, right? How many people have, you know, like, like impacted by 9-11, Occupy Wall Street, right? Black voters matter, Black lives matter, right? So there's a, a politic uh, that comes from sort of being uh, a young person, a young worker, trying to figure out how, what kind of life we want to live, the kind of Georgia we want to build, the kind of America that we want to build. And so, again, we don't elect messiahs. So that... I, my, the group, we're not electing for somebody to, to join us in the group chat. We're not electing a homeboy, right? We're electing somebody that's going to DC to do the people's work. And I think that we are going to get that in Warnock and Asaf. Uh, some people are asking if you, if you need people to come there to canvas on the ground. People are asking about other ways to help. And one of those being like coming to Georgia to canvas on the ground to talk to voters directly. You know, I, you know, I, I don't know if we have consensus on this, you know, but we've been, uh, I mean, because it's, it's, it's tough, right? There's a lot of energy out there. People want to want to come and, and do canvassing. You know, I've been leaning and I, I think Stacey did a, a, a tweet saying this, um, um, you know, we, there are lots of ways folks can help from where you're, where you're at, um, you know, and, and money like tonight. Um, volunteering, like we already said, texting, phone banking, postcards. Um, you know, I mean, we got to, we, we just, we're trying to be very mindful that, you know, we are in the midst of this pandemic. It's it's a challenge enough, you know, and say talked about, we're going to be doing socially distanced, um, COVID safe, uh, canvassing, right, at a distance um, and all of that. But it's hard when you combine that, plus you got folks who have traveled across country, you know, sometimes from another state that might have 
higher COVID increases than we have here in Georgia. And Georgia is difficult because we got we got as a, as an illegitimate governor somebody who's a bigger COVID denier than than, than forty five is, right? And so um, so we're just trying to be mindful of all that. We want the support, but we also want folks to you know let's maximize the ways that folks can contribute from where they're at, um, and 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 you know get us the the support resources, you know tech. Uh, texting and all that and we we got folks here in georgia who can who can who can get this job done so we're we're thankful for the support but we think you know supporting remotely might be the best way there's a lot of questions in the q a about an organization called vote forward about letter the vote forward's letter writing campaigns does anybody have opinions about vote forward and the vote forward of the letter writing campaigns I'm, I'm not familiar, but you know, letters work. When I go and check my mailbox once a month, uh, <laughs> you know, it would be nice to have a letter. Listen, we are encouraging people to contribute in all of the ways that they can, right? And so, uh, you know, uh, there are folks who have a preferred tactic, um, but like, listen, at this point, I'm not turning down nothing but my collar. Right. And so if there is any way that folks can support, like I said, and it's, you know, as we're combating misinformation, retweeting instead of like retweeting um, disinformation from bad actors, both foreign and domestic and saying, look at these lies. Right. How about you amplify the dope messaging that's coming from Black Voters Matter uh, and New Georgia Project Action Fund and Black Male Voters Project. Right. That what one of the things like again, there are several tactics that are gonna allow us to compete for attention and allow us to compete for hearts and minds in this moment and we welcome them all. You know, the, the other thing that I wanna add too is, I think it's really important that we provide, um, that we need you all, we need you all to believe in us and actually help insulate us as well. I am very clear, we saw this in 2018 after New Georgia Project um, registered over almost a half a million voters, they came under attack. And what winds up happening is when we do this work, there's always a backlash. Whenever we do this work, there's gonna be a backlash. And so oftentimes, you know, when those messages try to take root, if there are people and that's, that's really what's happening um, to be able to combat that and really talk about our work and follow our work so you can speak to it and you can also be advocates to insulate us from those the, those attacks as well i just because i know it's on the horizon right the groups that do the work are always going to come under attack um whether they're true or not you know as long as the damage the perception and the damage is done um that's what some some folks attempt is so i do think to really be able to lift up i think even following our work so you're able um, to not just even be able to support in this moment, but really be able to speak to it and really be able to lift up and really be able to even provide um, some advocacy in, in, in when and if needed. Uh, before we close it out, because we're gonna let people, uh, I feel we're in closing about at, at the half hour. I'm on the West Coast, so that's 7.30 here. So we still got a whole evening ahead of us. I don't know what you people on the East Coast do, uh, but, uh, what the, the you and say so you brought up 71 percent of white georgians voted for trump a lot of this is about organizing black voters but we have a lot of white people on this call i can tell by the chats uh what is there a plan is there thoughts would you recommend people how to get to those 71 percent um listen collect your cousins Right, like we're heading into the holiday season, right? Uh, I think that there are tons of like anti-racist guides uh, that are providing support for people um, to have the hard conversations with their families over the holidays. Uh, and, you know, listen, as I learn um, from Cliff and Latasha that we lead with love and power um, and, you know, you, ultimately you love these people, right? Uh, I, I think that, you know, so a couple things. One, I feel like there are people who think that voting, your vote is a gift to the candidate. It is not. It is, a, voting is what you do for yourself. 
and your family, right? It is a way that you demonstrate your love. And so I think that having a conversation about, you know, what is important to people and what matters. But here's another thing. We are on a seven, now six week timeline, right? And so this is a battle of the bases. Um, I think that, you know, elections are compression points, right? They're opportunities for us to flex our power, to test our power. And so I don't, I, I won't speak for uh, BVM, but in this moment, we're not doing persuasion, right? Like in this moment, it is literally the battle of the bases. We are getting, we're getting our folks out, right? So that multiracial, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-generational, progressive majority that is in Georgia, we're making sure that they get out and that they vote. Um, but, you know, there's off this time for persuasion um, after that, but that takes time. Uh, we and, and again, that is also a part of the work that many of folks in our coalition do. But there's a difference between mobilization and and persuasion. And this is a mobilization moment. That's right. Any other thoughts? Is what what uh, uh, what can we leave these people with as we send them off? I'm going to go Cliff and Latasha. I'm going to let you close this out after Cliff. What other thoughts can we send these people out with about the stakes of this election? about how not to get down, about uh, uh, how to do the work? I mean, the stakes are high, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, as we, we say in the movement, I believe, I believe that we will win. Um, and you all here are playing a part in that. The financial contributions tonight, that's going to go a long way. All the volunteering that we know that you're gonna do after tonight, that's going to go a long way. Speaking truth to power, you know, particularly against, you know, the, the voters person that NSA talked about, earlier that we are sure to see. Yo, I mean, think about it, y'all. If, if Lindsey Graham called up the Secretary of State about an election that was basically over, <laughs> right? If he went that far about an election that was over, what you think these fools about to do about an election that's still Come got on. six, Come seven on. weeks to go, right? So, you know, and so we got to know that that's coming and we got to have folks who, you know, like I said, like Brother Ned out there in Wayne County, they, they got to be willing to speak truth to power and call folks out and and you know and, and be ungovernable if need be but we really going to need folks to really like have our backs um and provide that you know that wall of, of of support when you know stuff really starts going down and that's not to say you know we talk when we talk about voter suppression you know we always try to do it in a way where um we're, we're not doing the, the the doom and gloom right we're, we're going to call it out because we know it's coming because again we're not trying to be naive um but when we talk about, we finish it with, no matter what they do, they can't stop us, right? We're going to plan our work and work our plan and we're gonna be vigilant and we're gonna get, you know, like I always say, one of my favorite verses, you know, be not afraid, not to be thou dismayed, just gather your people of war and rise up. And we about to rise up and all of you on this call is a big part of this. So thank you all. I say, well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. 55 years ago, there were black folks on a bridge in Selma, Alabama um, that didn't have government on their side. They didn't have resources, but they literally had a belief and they had a faith in their own power and they changed this nation. They fundamentally changed voting in the world and inspired others. And in this moment, that there are some of us, we who believe in freedom shall not rest until it comes. And so I'll just say to stand with us as we stand, I'm asking you to stand with us. It has always been those who have literally had the courage, had the foresight to believe that they can push up against what other folks can't see that has always changed the course of history. And so Georgia, I don't know, I can't make no prediction of what's gonna happen. What I can promise you is that those of us who are on the front lines are gonna fight like hell, like to make sure that we are pushing, that we're going to organize ourselves. We're gonna give everything that we got in this process and something is going to change. Something is going to change. So I just ask you to stand with us as we stand with the communities that be fundamentally what is going to literally be able to transform this nation is when we are okay with standing in a space that may be unfamiliar or might be uncomfortable. We ain't got nothing else but a song in our heart our spirit is energized and we committed that we're literally going to stand unapologetically in our power. So thank you. 
I don't have a mic, so I'm gonna just drop this remote control. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Billy, take it away, because I'm not following that. Thank you all for ha Thank you all. There he is. Oh. Where's our birthday, Billy? Uh, you know, I, I know I speak for everyone on the call to just say we are so grateful, so grateful for all of you. And, and we have your back. And I want everyone who's on here right now, I know we can't hear each other, but we can feel each other, say, I have your back. If you have the backs of the people you've heard from tonight, say, I have your back. I, yeah, have, I have, your have your back. I have your back. The way that we're gonna get their backs is because is as much as they're organizing everyone in Georgia, we have to organize everyone in our lives to support them. That is, they're, they're on their job, we have to do our job just as seriously as they're doing their job. The calling is not just, yay, great organizers in Georgia, we sent you 50 bucks, we feel good about ourselves. Our calling is to organize everyone in our lives just as much as they're organizing everyone in their lives. And, and that is how we honor the work that they do. So just so grateful to be in this with you all forever. And, and, and so grateful um, we're, we have all been called um, to go do our work and, um, and we will celebrate you, with you all uh, um, every day in January 5th and for years to come as we transform this country. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight and spread the word. Let's keep building this movement. Happy birthday, Billy. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Billy. We love you, Happy Billy. Happy birthday, Billy. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.